Greetings to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. It is good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. I bring you greetings here from Friendship Baptist Church located at 5200 West Jackson Boulevard on the west side of Chicago. And on behalf of our pastor, Dr. Reginald E. Backus, our Sunday School Superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, all of the officers and members, our Sunday School instructors, and all of our students, we're just so blessed that again you have decided to share with us this morning as we prepare to enter into our lesson. Uh, today is uh, March 21st. Uh, 2021 the title of our lesson is seeking wisdom for the future and our lesson is found in the second book of kings the 22nd chapter verses 14 through 20 our key verse this morning is second kings chapter 22 verse 19 and i'll be reading from the new king james version the text reads because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the lord when you heard what i spoke against this place and against its inhabitants that they would become a desolation and a curse and you tore your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, says the Lord. Amen. Uh, we, again, just are thankful that you have joined with us. Seeking wisdom for the future is our lesson title. We'll jump right into it. And as always, we'll begin with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for another opportunity, another day to share in your word. Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. Thank you for waking us up and for starting us on our way. Now, Father, as we enter into this lesson, help us to recognize that we all have room for growth. If there are still uh, improvements that we need to make in our lives, help us to recognize what does not belong. By the aid of your Holy Spirit, remove what is not like you and replace it with your love and your wisdom. And as we enter into your word, lift us up higher that we might see you clearer and better understand your will for our lives. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Again, seeking wisdom for the future. Second King, Second Kings chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. Uh, this morning we have three goals. First, we will understand God's message for King Hosiah that was delivered by the prophetess Holda. We will examine Josiah's behavior after hearing from the book of law, and we will renew our commitment to seeking godly advice about our future. Now, before we jump into this lesson, let me just make it clear that there are a lot of names specifically in this 14th verse, and I may uh, mispronounce some of them, so just please Pray with me and bear with me. Uh, extend your grace to me. And I pray that God's grace is extended to me. Don't hold me too accountable. I know how we get over these names sometimes. Uh, but we, uh, when we start our lesson, uh, we, we see this king, the new king of Judah, Josiah. He's the son of King Ammon, and he became king of Judah at the young age of eight years old. Now, King Ammon was a wicked king who worshipped idols and sinned against God during his entire two-year reign. Josiah, upon becoming king, decided to turn from the wickedness that had been embraced by his father, King Ammon, during those two years he reigned, and by his grandfather, King Manasseh, who had reigned for 55 years. For the, so for the last 57 years, under the reign of King Manasseh and under the reign of King Ammon, his, father, his grandfather and father respectively, the children of Israel had departed worshiping God and had just embraced this idolatry, this idolat worship. So the temple uh, had, be, had been uh, transformed. It was no longer used to worship God, but instead used for uh, worship of idols. Hezekiah, his great-grandfather, the father of King Manasseh, the, his grandfather, the grandfather of King Amon, his father, King Hezekiah was the last great reformer of Israel. And when he ended his reign some 58 years ago at the point of this lesson, uh, he had already ushered in a new spirit of renewed worship and belief in God. And so the children of Israel had, had, had fallen into this pattern of not worshiping God and then worshiping God, of doing their own thing and then doing God's thing. And this cycle kind of just seemed to never stop. And so we have King Hezekiah, 58 years ago was the king that ushered in this new era of reform. His son, King Manasseh, his grandson, King Ammon, the grandfather and father, of King Josiah, that's the subject of our story, uh, they kind of return to this wickedness. And so we see King Josiah, 58 years after his grandfather Hezekiah, is a reformer. He recognizes that the children of Israel are called to worship God, and he's seeking to find ways to return the children of Israel from this worship of idols into a true worship of God. So God sent a prophet, Holda, H-U-L-D-A-H, to deliver his message to this young king. She was a woman who was selected by God and was called to be God's messenger. 
Now, previously, even though it wasn't a, a many times, there have been other times when God has used women uh, as his messengers, as his prophets in the time where he needed the people to hear his voice. Uh, he used Miriam, the sister of Moses. He used Deborah. He used Noadiah. And he used Isaiah's wife, who isn't named in the Bible. And then also, even to speak a word of only for a brief moment, he used Rachel, Hannah, and Abigail. So God has continued to use women uh, to be deliverers of his message to his chosen people. And if we remember our Sunday school lessons from about three to six weeks back, we looked at the different women, starting with the woman at the well, with uh, uh, the woman in uh, uh, Laodicea, specifically in Philippi, when we talked about uh, Lydia, and so many other women that God was able to use to be messengers for his people. Uh, what this shows us is that uh, being effective and being used by God is not gender specific. Uh, a lot of times we tend to think of specific roles, specific positions in the church and our ministries as gender specific, but God can use anybody. And I keep going back to those words of Jesus Christ right before the triumphal entry when they asked him, why do your people make such a fuss? And Jesus says that they did not worship and celebrate me, that the rocks would cry out for me. And my brothers and sisters, we must recognize that one day at a point in our lives in the near future, that all of creation will worship and bow down before God. And so we don't want to limit the ability to worship, the ability to lead, the ability to deliver a message from the Lord to a specific gender or a specific race or ethnicity, but God can use anybody, anywhere, anyhow he chooses. And so this is another wonderful lesson with this prophet this of hold to how God continues to uh, remove all boundaries in ministry and allow many different types of people to be used many different types of ways by the Lord. So and when Hosea became the king, he demanded that all these new uh, changes be put in place, and he started with the temple. We must cleanse the temple, remove what does not belong, and return it to the time of Solomon, how it was intended to be a place of worship for God. Now, in the process of cleansing the temple, uh, the, uh, the high priest uh, Hilkiah found the book of law, which many people believe to be the book of Deuteronomy that was given to Mo uh, Moses and Joshua uh, when the Pentateuch was first uh, written. So Deuteronomy, the fifth book in the Bible, the fifth book of the Pentateuch, the last book of Moses, uh, this is the book that they believe that was found by Hilkiah, the, the high priest. And immediately when he found the book, he sought to, one, to uh, certify his authenticity, but also to understand what it meant and what the implications in the book meant for Israel at that day. So this move, this move, the young king, Hosiah, uh, to follow in the footsteps of his grandfather, King Hezekiah and institute reforms across the land and usher in a new era of obedience to God's word amongst all of Judah and all of God's chosen people, the children of Israel. So we'll jump into our lesson. It is not a long lesson, just three separate parts, but we'll jump right in and we'll understand this morning uh, why this lesson is entitled Seeking Wisdom for the Future, and hopefully we'll be able to apply these lessons in our own lives and our own faith to strengthen us according to God's will. Now again, before I read this 14th verse, Please pray with me and for me. I understand that I might mistake or mispronounce some of these words or some of these names. And so just please, excuse me, count it to my head and definitely not my heart. So I'll begin reading uh, 2 Kings chapter 22 and just the 14th verse. Uh, okay, so the text reads, so Hilkiah, the priest, Uachim, Atbor, Shaphan and Isaiah went to Holda the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Titva, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. She dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they spoke with her. I'll try to read it one more time. Just the 14th verse, 2 Kings chapter 22. So Hilkiah the priest, Uachim, Uachim, Atbor, Shaphan, and Isaiah, and Azahiah, went to hold of the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Titva, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe she dwelt in jerusalem in the second quarter and they spoke with her and so let me just 
kind of say it. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word first. So in verse 14, we see the high priest Hilkiah and his entourage, one who is his secretary, this group of men, four of them, uh, excuse me, five of them, they go to Hil Huldah, the prophetess. So they find this book by, while cleaning the temple, cleansing the temple, and they find the book of Deuteronomy, the book of law. And they immediately recognize it as the word of the Lord, the words of Moses, but they just want to be sure. And the best way to be sure is to take it to the prophetess who hears directly from God. Uh, I must admit that oftentimes in my life, when I'm studying, when I'm reading the word of God, when I'm in lesson or sermon preparation, that I sometimes come across things that are either not familiar to me or things that I've forgotten or things that I was just not sure about. And so I seek out the advice of those around me, those that have been built up in the word, those that give themselves the study of the word, just to make sure not only that I'm right, but to make sure that they are kind of in agreement with me, that our spirits are aligned in interpreting the word of God. A perfect example was just last week in our Sunday school lesson uh, when uh, Joshua saw the angel of the Lord before the battle of Jericho, that he asked the Lord, the angel, whose side are you on? The angels, are you on our side or their side? The angel said, nay. And then Joshua fell down in reverence. The angel of the Lord said, take off your shoes. You are on holy ground. I knew that I had heard that before, but I thought that maybe it was more than just when Moses went to God to receive the Ten Commandments. And so I called Pastor Bacchus. Pastor Bacchus, I know God told Moses to take off his shoes. And now we see the angel of the Lord telling uh, the, I'm sorry, the angel of the Lord, the messenger of the Lord, the, the commander of the Lord's army telling uh, Joshua to take off his shoes. Is there any other place in the Bible where that happens? I didn't think it was, but Pastor Bacchus said no. And we just kind of talked about what it meant. And we talked about wedding rituals and things like that. Now, most of the information that we shared and went over wasn't used for the lesson last week, but it still helped me to get an understanding of what exactly it meant to take off your shoes on holy ground. And so my brothers and sisters, oftentimes in our life when we're studying, when we're going through God's word, when we're reading and laboring in his word, uh, it's important that we have not only the resources around us, but people in our lives that we can go to and depend on to kind of make sure that we're right. Now, I pray for God's direction and understanding for him to reveal his word in my life and the meaning of his word in my preparation. But I also recognize that there's some things that I may not get or I might have trouble with, or I might stumble over. And so it's good to have people in your lives. Uh, and, and I would dare say that we should all know at least two or three people that we trust and that are spiritually aligned with us, that see God in the same way that we see God, that have a deep understanding of God's word, that we can trust and go to. Perhaps it's your pastor. Perhaps it's your Sunday school instructor. Perhaps it's your mother or your father. But there should be people in our lives that when we're struggling with the word, or interpreting God's word and demands in our lives that we should trust. So when, when Hilkiah the high priest finds this book, the book of Deuteronomy, the book of the law, he immediately takes it to hold of the high priest and the prophetess, and he asked her for instruction. So in our lesson, Josiah, even at a young age, recognized that the children of Israel had fallen away from what God had commanded them to be. They had spent almost 60 years ignoring the commandments of God and worshiping idols under uh, King Ammon and King Manasseh. The temple had now been transformed from a place of worship of God to a place of worship for idols. And King Manasseh had built shrines and idols and false gods all across the land of Israel, and the people were known to be evil in the sight of the Lord. So Josiah instructed the high priest to clean and purge the temple, beginning a process of removing what does not belong, cleansing the temple and the items that should not be there. So during this cleansing, the prophet Hilkiah found the book of law and traveled along with his secretary and three other men to the prophet Huldah to seek her direction as, the contents, as to the contents and authenticity of the book. We can find strength and joy in the introduction of our story, just this 14th verse, because we find that in the midst of chaos, in the midst of nationwide sin, God still has a few people that are strong in faith and hold true to his word. Now, I used to uh, grow up, uh, me and my father watched a few television shows uh, together. One of the ones that we watched together whenever we could was Star Trek, The Next Generation. We are Trekkies. We love sci-fi. 
And Star Trek, The Next Generation, was the first show I really remember uh, watching religiously with my father. I mean, I didn't miss an episode. Now, I would love the show, but I would especially love it when they would face certain battle situations and they would be forced to separate the ship, the saucer section, and the main hull of the ship. During these times, the ship would often be run by a small uh, contingent of crew members known as the Skeleton Crew. In these episodes, I learned that the, a small group of the right people could be as effective and perhaps even more effective than the entire ship of people. Now, when we look at Israel, it's easy, it's easy to become discouraged because for over half a century, the children of Israel, led by bad kings, have disobeyed and turned their backs against God. But we are encouraged because in our lesson today, we see that in the midst of corruption, in the midst of sin and disobedience, God has preserved his people through a small remnant of God-fearing and God-obeying children. And when I would watch Star Trek, the next generation, they would take the best officers, the most well-equipped officers, and put them in the uh, engineering section with the battle bridge. And they would send all the civilians and the lesser officers on the saucer section to go away to safety. It would be in these times when they would face their most troublesome and most their largest foes, their largest opponents, but because they had the right people on the ship, even though the odds were against them, they always came out on top. Now, as we look for ways to improve our communities and grow our churches, it is easy to become overwhelmed with the sin and corruption that captures the headlines of our evangelical movement. Even now, Issues of racism and turning a blind eye to sin are conversations that are separating God's children and weakening our impact as lights in the midst of darkness. One of the most famous uh, pastor leaders of the Southern Baptist movement just withdrew herself from the movement because she simply recognized that the Southern Baptist movement and adhering uh, or, or not standing up against some of the things that they that were blatantly sinful from our former president stood in the way of the movement being able to stand on the side of Christ. Uh, it seems as if we can't turn on our television, whether it's an issue with the pastor and infidelity that captures our headlines, whether right now uh, the Twitter feed this week was going crazy with memes of Kirk Franklin because of the recording that his son put out when he uh when him and his son were having an argument on the on the phone so often our leaders our institutions present themselves in a bad light and people are using that against us as excuses of why the church is no longer relevant or why they do not have to in turn give their lives to Christ but my brothers and sisters we see through this text through this 8 year old boy king Josiah through the high priest that recognized the word of God and through Holda, the high priestess, I mean the prophetess of God that was continuing to be a strong example of God's word that God continues to provide even in the midst of corruption, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of sin, God continues to provide leaders that will steer us towards his word and towards his will in our lives. Just like the children of Israel in our texts, we too can stay encouraged knowing that God continues to send good men and women as voices crying in the wilderness, as lights in the midst of darkness, as soldiers on the battlefield for God. So we see in verse 14 of 2 Kings chapter 22, we see Josiah's delegation to the prophetess Huldah. But then in 2 Kings 22 verses 15 through 17, we see Huldah's answer and prophecy. The text reads, Then she said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants. All the words of the book which the king of Judah has read, because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods, that they might provo uh, provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be aroused against this place, and shall not be quenched. Amen. So in, in leadership, we are often trained to use the ice cream method, uh, the sandwich method, if you will. You package bad news in between good news, and it's often useful for helping people digest criticism and correction. So I'll say you did very good today, but next time I need you to be on time. 
However, when you got here, your work was amazing. This not only corrects the listener, but helps them understand that I also recognize their strengths and I'm not just focusing on their weaknesses. Now, this sandwich method has been a tried and proven tactic in relaying uh, uncomfortable information to subordinates. Now, I say all this just to point out that Holder must have skipped this part in her leadership training because when the delegation of priests gets to her with the book of law, she has no good news to share. She immediately tells them the matter of fact truth of God's word and what it means in relation to the children of Israel. When the priest and his group arrive to, to, uh, to present her the word, she not only certifies that it's authentic, but she goes further to say that the punishment outlined in the book are going to be directly directed to God's people because of his wrath towards, him, towards them. The urgency and the matter-of-fact approach that Holder uses shows the extreme nature of her message and the seriousness of the situation that God's people are now in. Now, beginning with thus saith the Lord, Holder makes it immediately clear that she is speaking as, God, as God's prophetess and not, as of her, not of her own. Using the same words that prophets of old use, she lets the priest know that God has sent a message through her and his message has direct consequences for his children's disobedience and idolatrous worship. She specifically instructs the priest to return to King Josiah and let him know what thus saith the Lord. Now, we can assume that Hoda was concerned with the state of her people as the prophetess of God and most certainly recognized just how far the children of God drifted away from his word. Now, while we don't know what steps she took to stand up for the sake of God prior to this passage, we see from her standing and from her obedience that she must have remained faithful to God during this wicked time in the life of God's chosen people. This is good news for us because in our own lives, so often in life, we become easily frustrated when we see wrong, when we recognize what needs to be done, but are not able to overcome the challenges and circumstances that stand in our way. Even in my own life, in my own ministries that I've been blessed to be a part of, I've seen corruption, I've seen sin, and I've seen all matters of things that are contrary to the word of God, even in my own life and my own actions. It is easy to become distraught, and we are quick to give up, throw in the towel, and run away because the people that we are called to lead, to serve, and to work with would rather do their own thing instead of the right thing. But instead of giving up, running away or throwing in the towel, we should follow the example of Holder and recognize that if we remain faithful to God and stay ready to be used by God, when God is ready, we can be a part of the change that he wants to make happen in the life of his chosen people. I can see in my sanctified imagination Holder praying day after day and year after year for God to change the hearts of his people. And after two wicked kings in Manasseh and Ammon, God sends a boy king, an eight-year-old Josiah, to usher in a new season of change. Uh, I always say that uh, we must recognize in our lives when it's our time, but not our turn. Now, when I was young, we would go to the bathroom, and the teacher would line up the entire classroom. She would say, it's bathroom time. That meant it was time for us all to use the bathroom. However, there were only a few stalls in the bathroom, and even though it was time for the bathroom, we all had to wait our turn because of limited space. What happens in life is that God allows us to move in our time, but we must still wait our turn. And we become frustrating, frustrated in the waiting of life that we assume that just because it's our time, that it should be immediately our turn. And for our younger generations, uh, I'm 38, it seems that we are in such a fast-paced move and we need a, a spirit of immediacy to just get what we got coming right now. We just don't want to wait our turn. Uh, the good news is that Holder, as the prophetess of God, it was time for her to share God's word with God's people. And I'm sure she looked at the prophets of old and prayed that her impact would be as meaningful as their impact had been before her. And I'm sure 
that even though King Manasseh, Manasseh was doing his own thing, that King Amon was doing his own thing, if she was the prophetess of God during their reigns, which most likely she was at least a portion of their reigns, that she was praying, that she was instructing and prophesying to God's people. But instead of being discouraged, instead of giving up, instead of quitting her job, she continued to remain steadfast and faithful to God's calling in her life, trusting that even though she did not know when or did not understand how, that God would one day make her effective in his kingdom. I'm sure when she saw Hezekiah uh, turn over the mantle to Manasseh and he did his own thing, and Amon, his son, grew even more wicked, she probably did not have much hope for King Josiah. But she continued to trust in God and remain faithful to the promises of God. And sure enough, even though it did not seem that it was coming, God sent a reformer just like he sent Hezekiah some 58 years prior. He sent a reformer in the person of Josiah, the king, this boy king, to change the hearts of God's people by doing away with idolatrous worship and returning the people into a true worship of God. Holder's words were meant to stop the children of Israel in their place and lead them to recognize their wrong as well as the coming judgment that God would send their way. She shared God's words that he would bring evil to this place. Now, we don't necessarily know what she meant by this place, but there's three things she could have meant. First, she could have meant the place of worship. The temple had become defiled and was used for worship of idols. And she, perhaps she referenced that God would destroy the temple, which in fact he did allow to happen later on. She might have meant all of Jerusalem. That because Jerusalem had turned their backs on God, that God would in turn turn his back on them. Or perhaps she meant specifically the people because the people's hearts had become wicked. But whatever she meant, whether it be the temple, the land of Jerusalem, or the people of Jerusalem, her words were specific and clear that because of their disobedience, because of their idolatry and worship of idols, that God would now turn his wrath against the children of Israel and they would experience the anger and wrath of God and no longer the blessings and protection of God. God promised Israel that the temple would be an example of God's love so that other nations would see its glory and recognize that he is God. But in the same manner, God warned Israel that if they continued to be disobedient, that he would turn his wrath against them and destroy being disobedient to God. Too often, people of God, we church Christian, we live our lives as if we have time to get together. To live in a life after we get our own selfish desires out the way and under control. But through experience, we have learned too often that waiting until the deadline sometimes puts us in a position where we can't catch up or we don't have the energy to do what needs to be done. Let us never and stop following in the footsteps of the children of Israel in this text, or the mistakes that so many have made before us. Today, in the words of Holda, we content, uh, her words continue to reign true, that we must recognize our sins, turn from our wicked ways, seek the face of, seek the, face of the Lord, and live a life that's pleasing in his sight. So we see Josiah's delegation to the prophet is Holder. We see Holder's answer and prophecy. But then finally in 2 Kings chapter 22, verses 18 through 20, we see Holder's prophetic promise to Josiah. Now the text, 2 Kings 22, 18 through 22 reads, for as, for, But as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, in this manner you shall speak to him. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which you have heard, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse, and you tore your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, says the Lord. Surely, therefore, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place. So they brought back the word to the king. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. So again, let's just look at what happened. King Josiah, this boy king, takes over at eight after his father Amon. Amon, just like his father Manasseh, 
were wicked kings, evil on the side of the Lord, and ushered in a new spirit of rebelliousness and wickedness amongst all of Israel. Now, King Josiah, at the age of eight, it says, I believe it was 12 years after the age, so maybe at the age of 20, and then again at the age of 28, uh, he, he instituted these reforms. And his first reform was to instruct the high priest to cleanse the temple. While cleansing the temple, they found the book of law, the book of Deuteronomy, given to Moses and Joshua. They take it to the king, and the king in turn instructs them to take it to the prophetess. She instructs them that it is real, and then immediately, in verses 15 through 17, she gives them the bad news that God's wrath will indeed be turned against the children of Israel. But then as we move down to 2 Kings 22, verses 18 through 20, she in turn has a message specifically for young King Hosea, from God uh, that she wants the high priest to take in turn. Now in verse 18, after delivering the news of God's coming wrath against the children of Israel, Holder gives a word that is specifically meant for King Josiah. She tells the priest that King Josiah will be spared from the coming judgment and will not endure what Israel will soon experience. In her prophecy, she gives three reasons why Josiah will be spared. Her first reason is that his heart was receptive of the word of God. She says specifically, because your heart is tender. He not only heard the word of God, but he received the word of God and lived a life according to the word of God. Uh, there's a few phrases that come to mind. My words are falling on deaf ears. It's going in one ear and out the other. The words of the Lord were not first delivered to the children of Israel by the prophet as holder. Because of the priest's obedience to God, because of the prophetess' steadfastness in the Lord, and I'm sure others around them, the, uh, the delegation that went with the priest to holder, we can see that there were still strong men and women of God within Israel, even in the midst of this wickedness. And the problem was not that the word of God was not going forth. The problem is that the children of Israel had decided to ignore the word of God and do their own thing. My brothers and sisters, we must be attentive and receptive to the word of God. Not only should we hear it, but we should receive it and apply it to our living. It does no good to know what to do, but continue to do your own thing. Uh, so often in life, I tell the story that when I would get furniture, instead of looking at the instructions, I would try to put it together myself, and I would have all these extra pieces, quickly realizing that even though it looked like it did in the picture, because there were some things missing, it had no chance of being durable and being as effective as it was meant to be. What I had to realize is that even though I thought I knew what was best, even though I thought that I could interpret it on my own, that it was best to pay attention to the person who wrote the instructions. And it's the same thing in our own lives. We must be tender-hearted to God's word, meaning that we not only hear it, but we receive it recognizing that his words are better for our living than our own words. So hold a list three reasons why Josiah will be spared. First, that his heart was uh, receptive of the word of God, that he was tender-hearted. But secondly, that he humbled himself. Now, as king, it was easy for him to do his own thing, especially by watching and following the example of his father and grandfather. By all rights, King Josiah could have done whatever he wanted, and no one would have questioned him. But he was humble enough to reject his own power, reject his own selfish desires, and realize that he was better off doing God's thing than his own thing. thing and live lives as if there are no consequences but we must live our lives in recognition that God is always watching and our actions are always influencing other people and so King Josiah recognized that even though his father and grandfather did whatever they wanted to that he was not going to live his life the same way that they did he was going to humble himself and submit to the will of God in his life so hold up these three reasons why Josiah will be spared first that his heart was Receptive to the word of God, he was tenderhearted. Secondly, that he was humble. But third and finally, that he wept before the Lord. It said that when he heard the judgment, that he tore his clothes and wept. Now, a king would never position himself to show such uh, vulnerability, specifically in front of his subjects. 
But the wrath of God being turned against his people and uh, consequently the king's uh, people uh, hurt Josiah so much that he was not able to stay in control. His emotions took over. It shows the heart of the king. It shows that even in the midst of this wickedness and the sinful state that he still loved his people so much that he wanted what was best for them and that he was hurt that God would now turn his back against them. It is oftentimes, and I see it so often, where people say we wish harm on others because of the way they've treated us. Josiah, by all rights, could have hardened his heart against those that turned their backs against God. But he still loved them the same way God loves us. That in spite of our shortcomings, in spite of our mistakes, in spite of our failings, in spite of our sinful nature, God continues to love us and give us chance after chance after chance. And so my brothers and sisters, not only do we look at Holder as an example of being the strong woman of God in the midst of corruption, not only do we look at this high priest of recognizing what God had called us to be and what God has called us to do in our lives, but we can also look at this king. That even when the people are filled with evil, filled with sin, he continues to love them and desire what's best for them according to God's will. This is a wonderful lesson. We have three amazing soldiers of God. A wonderful woman that was the prophetess, delivered the word of God. A wonderful priest that remained steadfast in the midst of corruption. And a wonderful young king that did not follow the example of his forefathers, but instead turned his heart away from the world and towards God. When we look at our own lives, when we look at what God has called us to be, we need to make a commitment that we'll seek wisdom in our own future, to not be distracted or overwhelmed by the wickedness of the world, but to remain steadfast and rooted in God's word, even when we stand alone, to trust that what God has for us is better than what we could ever get from the world. But then also we need to make sure that we go to God and submit to his will and recognize that he has a better plan than we could ever have for ourselves. But finally, continue to love God's people, continue to want what's best for God's people, even when they do uh, sin against God's will, even when they sin against us. Continue to show them love. Why? Because God continues to love us in spite of our mistakes. What a wonderful lesson. I praise God for you that have joined with us this morning. I pray that you were strengthened by this word that we continue to seek God's wisdom in our lives for our future, that we be continue to be built up according to God's will, and that we seek God's direction in all that we do. We praise God for you joining with us here. Uh, if you would like to uh, join us here at Friendship Church, we will be more than happy to invite you in to be a part of our church family. We have some amazing programs continuing to go on, even though we're separated because of this COVID pandemic. Each Tuesday morning, our senior associate, Reverend Aaron Davidson, leads us in a wonderful prayer call at 8 a.m. The login information is on our church website. On Wednesday evenings, our pastor, Dr. Backus, delivers our uh, uh Sunday, our, our evening Bible class, uh, we're currently going through the parables of Jesus Christ. And then on Sunday morning, we continue to have our Sunday school lessons, but we're also having a live worship service that's available on our YouTube and Facebook pages at 11 a.m. If you'd like to join us in person, we have limited seating. You can find us on our Eventbrite page for registration information, but then always tune in uh, digitally through YouTube and Facebook. If you would like to support this church and some of the wonderful things that we are doing uh, through ministry and within our community, uh, you can give four ways, four different ways we have to give. You can use our giving tab on our church website, fbcchicago.org. You can text the word give to 773-992-1462. You can use the cash app on your smartphone, dollar sign, Friendship Chicago, or you can mail your check or money order to the church, Friendship Baptist Church, 5200 West Jackson Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60644. For those of you all who have given or are considering to give, we praise God for your sacrifice. We praise God for your uh, commitment to supporting this ministry. And we just ask that God continue to bless you and let his face shine upon you. Uh, we pray that you have a wonderful week. 
Our prayer is that you will join us at 11 a.m. for our live worship service. We are currently celebrating the 14th anniversary of our pastor, Dr. Reginald Backus, 14 years of faithful leadership and uh, guidance to this wonderful congregation. So happy anniversary to our pastor. Praise God for each and every one of you. And our prayers is that God continues to guide you in your lives. We will dismiss with prayer, and then we pray that you have a wonderful day. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this lesson. We thank you for your word. Thank you for making it available to us, and we ask that you apply it uh, to the strengthening of your kingdom, to the spread of your gospel, that we might be better equipped for your will in our lives. Father, we enter into this place to worship, but we exit to serve. So equip us and give us the energy and the patience and the love that we need to be shining lights in the midst of darkness, that others might see our good works, but glorify you and come running asking what they must do to be saved. We ask a special prayer for our pastor that you continue to bless and enrich him. We thank you for 14 years of service, and we praise you for all that you have done and will continue to do through him in the life of your people and in this church specifically. Bless each home and person that's gathered today. Let your presence be revealed in our lives. Strengthen us and heal us like never before, and we'll pray that we give you glory and honor that all that we are and all that we do. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please continue to wash your hands. Uh, watch your distance, wear a mask. Let's help uh, curb the spread of this pandemic. Please know that we love you and that God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. And if God sees fit to bring us back, prayerfully we'll see you next week. God bless each and every one of you. Have a wonderful day and uh, trust in God and all things in your life. Amen. Uh, have a blessed day.